Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Breakfast Club, episode 21. I hope you liked our um, fancy new graphic intro. I feel a lot more polished. Um, and for episode 21, we are actually welcoming back one of our original guests, number two, I think, uh, Dr. Lauren Esposito, who is our curator of arachnology at the Academy. Hey, Lauren. Hey. Thanks for coming back. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Um, so Lauren is here to kick off our um, like mini series for Pride Week, uh, which is a two part series, one today and one on um, Thursday. But before we get into that, I wanted to take a quick second to just um, acknowledge that Breakfast Club, along with all the other Academy accounts have been silent for June. And part of that was because um, what we had to say was not the most important thing. So other people needed space to talk. And also because we had work to do. Um, up until now, the Academy, um, the like focus of Academy digital channels, so social media, things like this, offerings, um, like video, whatever, live streams, have all been focused on kind of promoting and elevating academy science and academy scientists, um, which is great, but like a lot of old and storied scientific institutions, um, academy science staff, and press, past and present, is largely white. So by only focusing on them, we're really not able to create or like present a accurate um, picture of what the people driving science looks like today and what science itself looks like today. So our plan going forward is to expand our focus outside of the academy, bring in lots of other people in lots of other fields in all kinds of different career stages, um, and really try to do a better job of um, showing you and introducing you and letting you connect directly with um, the people who really are driving science today. So we hope that you're as excited about that as we are. Um, and with that, I'll bring it back to Lauren. and. Um, so thank you again, Lauren, for being here. And I don't want a story, but I did want to ask, when you started this visibility movement two years ago, did you ever think that it would get this big? No, I mean, I thought it would be like most of my projects, which is like a like a good hearted start. And then like a slowly tapers off to me being terrible at continuing to keep the momentum up. So that's like, <laughs> that's like the story of every every research project I've ever started. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, maybe for the, better or worse. And so, yeah. But the difference is like this time you were like not alone in it very long. Like no, the people piled on. That is true. That's yeah. true. It's easy to stay, it's just like keep the, the energy up when there's other people bringing that energy. Yeah, totally. Uh, I'm glad that you're here today because I have to tell you I am feeling very like sweaty about doing breakfast clubs again like I feel like I was really good at them when we stopped and now I just it's like novice novice camp oh, all over no. again so but but I feel like you you like hit your stride right from the beginning so I don't know what you're talking about I mean that's it's nice like riding it's a bike, not right? true yeah <laughs> no um <laughs> I think I want to like get out of here and just hand it over to you. But um, I remember my spiel about encouraging people to ask questions, which is that whether you are watching on Facebook or YouTube, um, yeah, please leave questions um, or comments for Lauren anytime at all in the comment section on Facebook or the chat box on YouTube. And we'll come back to her at the end and um, ask as many of them as we can. And, you know, I think that people are often kind of hesitant to ask questions about issues around like queer identity or queer work or things like that. And I, this is a really good space to do that. So if you have questions about how to support people in the workplace or what is helpful and what is not helpful, like we would just really encourage you to ask. Um, so with that, I will hand it over unless there's anything else you wanna say first, Lauren. I think I might have lots of time to say all the things. Yes, yeah. okay, cool. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> the title of Lauren's talk today is Making a Movement, the Importance of LGBTQ plus Visibility in STEM. And yeah, super stoked that you are here and we'll see you at the end. Hi, well, happy Pride. Uh, thanks for joining me. Um, I'm Dr. Lauren Esposito and I'm the curator of arachnology, which is scorpion spiders and other creepy things at the California Academy of Sciences. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I always forget to do that and I'm trying to get in the habit of, of being better about practicing what, what I preach. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about, about this thing that I created that I'm gonna tell you about in just a minute. Um, and I'm also really happy to be celebrating Pride uh, this, this week, especially on the heels of the Supreme Court decision uh, making uh, LGBTQ status something that is a protected class of employment just a week and a half ago, I guess it was, or maybe two weeks exactly today. Um, so that feels, particularly celebratory. And 
it also makes me a little bit, you know, the things that have happened over the last couple of weeks or I guess month really in the U.S. have have really made me stop and reflect a little bit on on what pride in them. June is largely considered the month the month of pride, at least here in North America. Um, and what what does pride really mean? And and you know, I think people think about pride most most times as a celebration. Uh, and I was thinking about it as a celebration too when I when I first started thinking about Pride events for Breakfast Club like six weeks ago. Um, but when I signed up to do these events, I, I, the reality is that both George Floyd, who I'm sure you've heard of by now, uh, and Tony McDade, who was is, was a trans man who was killed by police four days after George Floyd in Florida, they were both still alive. So. I was in a celebratory mood. Uh, and after those events, Pride started feeling less celebratory. Uh, and as I've spent time sort of reflecting on this, I was reminded by many folks, especially on social media, discussing that while Pride is a, a celebration of the rights that we've won, especially the rights that we've won in, in North America and in Europe, um, LGBTQ people, by we, sorry, that wasn't clear. I belong to that same group. Uh, it wasn't always a celebration. And in fact, really, pride began as a protest. It began as, as riots that were led by queer and trans people of color who were really fed up by the harassment and the brutality um, that they'd endured at the hands of both police and at the hands of society. Uh, so in that sense, it actually seems quite fitting, the events that have transpired over the last few weeks, that in this month of pride, our country rise up against systemic oppression and racism and violence that black people in America continue to endure. And I think as intersectional and really complex humans, it's really important that we consider all of those parts of our identity that give us privilege, even while recognizing that we might have suffered our own form of oppression. For example, as the privileged white skinned mother of a black man in America, I'm tired of being afraid for him. And really, as the, but as the grandmother of a black child in America, I also grieve for the day that he realizes the fear that so many people feel. So I think let's talk about then how we can do our part to end inherent discrimination in science and really welcome uh, diversity in. And on that note, I wanna tell you a little bit about me and about my history. Um, I grew up here where the star is on this map. It's uh, right on the border of uh, US and Mexico in a, a binational metropolis. And on the US side, it's called the city of El Paso. And on the Mexican side, it's called Ciudad Juarez. And growing up in this community, I was, it's a Hispanic community. I was surrounded by Hispanic culture. Um, what is the minority in a large part of the US was, was the majority there. and. That's the culture that I grew up in and the culture that I love. But it's also a hard culture to, I think, to come of age as a queer person. And at least it was at the time that I was growing up. Uh, because even for those people that are not practicing Catholics, Catholicism is a really ingrained part of the culture of Hispanic communities. It's it's ingrained through the, the history of, of Spanish colonizers that brought Catholicism and instilled Catholicism in the, in the, in the native people of, of Mexico and Central America. And what it brought with it was a sense of guilt, uh, particularly around being gay and queer. Uh, so, so coming out for me was, was uh, not the easiest uh, because of that culture. And I, um, I guess I, I spent a lot of time sort of in nature because I was kind of like a, I wouldn't say an odd kid, but I was certainly a tomboy. I preferred playing with the guys on the school ground and what I loved, but what I loved more than anything was, was just being in nature. And I think it was really like that experience of being in nature that led me later in life to realize that like what I wanted to do for a career was spend time in nature, which is amazing. and. And I feel so lucky that I was able to have that early experience falling in love with nature so that I could realize later that it was sort of my life's calling to, 
to defend nature, to study nature, to do research in nature. Uh, and I think I remember the moment when I when I realized that that was a career option and feeling so excited that that was actually just something that you can do. Um, okay, so fast forward, I grew up in El Paso. I went to college in El Paso. I left El Paso uh, after graduating college to start a master's and PhD program at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. It was the first time that I'd ever left the predominantly Hispanic borderlands and moved into an extremely diverse city. Uh, and when I got there, I realized that, that my undergraduate experience had probably been pretty different from a lot of other people, certainly a lot of my peers at, in, in university. And, and so I think that that was kind of when I first started thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion in science. Um, and, and there's been quite a lot of studies that have been done about the experience for undergraduate students in undergraduate universities here in the US. Um, and and what by and large what those studies say is that uh, underrepresented minorities and women have a much more difficult time in college than uh, white and cisgendered um, um, undergraduate students and men. Uh, so the first thing is, is um, underrepresented minorities have six year completion rates of, of undergraduate degrees that are half that of their Asian and white peers. And so what that means is that undergraduate minorities aren't finishing their bachelor's degree within six years at the same rate of white and Asian undergraduates. Uh, and this is for life science, for, sorry, for, for STEM um, degrees. Another thing that I learned, which is kind of shocking, is that women perform worse than men in introductory STEM classes. And, and this is really in spite of being just as well prepared for college, having just as good of SAT scores, which let's be honest, SATs aren't great. They're really a, a proxy for, for how white and middle class you are. Um, but for whatever purposes, whether you're a white woman or, or a, a woman of color, you are gonna perform worse on average than men in your introductory STEM classes for no good reason. Um, other than self, probably self-doubt. Uh, first generation students, regardless of their, of their ethnic background, have the highest dropout rates of any student, single student group. So if you have never had a parent or a grandparent uh, or an aunt or an uncle, or probably even a cousin go to college, you have a really high, high likelihood or a much higher chance that you're going to drop out of college because you simply don't have the support system at home to help you figure out how to get through uh, college degree. Uh, and for me, I think you know the, the statistics that are really the most profound because I work in life sciences are those that are concerning the life sciences. So in the US, Black, Latino, and Native Americans make up 30% of the population. But they're only 17% of undergraduate students in life, enrolled in, under, in life science undergraduate degrees. So what that means is that we're really doing an awful job of recruiting Black, Latino, and Native American students into life sciences undergrads. Uh, and there's that's, uh, for me, a, it feels like a problem because we know through actual science that uh, innovation is done when there's large levels of diversity uh, on working teams. So, so the greater the diversity that you have on a, on a research team, the higher the probability that that research team is gonna do something really innovative that propels science forward. So when we're unable to recruit people at the basic level into science fields, we're inhibiting our ability to be innovative uh, in this country. And, and as a scientist, that's something that I would be really excited about. I'm excited about innovation. And so therefore I would be really excited to be on a team that's discovering something innovative. Uh, but but unfortunately, we're crippling ourselves. But here, what I'm here to talk to you about today is is not necessarily the the diversity, equity, and inclusion problem for um, uh, people that are that are for women or for for uh, uh, underrepresented minorities. I'm here to talk to you about the diversity, equity, and inclusion problem for LGBTQ people in STEM. Um, and usually I would start talking about this by showing you this map and, and telling you that the underlying problem is that 
LGBTQ status is not a protected class of employment in the United States in every state other than those in purple. But as of two weeks ago, that's no longer true. Uh, the Supreme Court finally ruled in the year 2020 that being gay, lesbian, or transgender is a protected class of employment in the United States. So two weeks ago, living in my home state of Texas, I could have walked into work and literally been fired the very next day if somebody found out that I was gay. And that would have been a totally valid reason. Um, but this week I can keep my job. Uh, so I think that that's a, pre a pretty pivotal thing and um, we'll see what, what that leads to in the future in terms of people feeling safer in their workplace and, and, and being out in their workplace. Um, but I think that, that for all of us that are queer in this country, it's a really a moment to celebrate. I wanna talk first about undergraduates and their experiences in, in uh, undergraduate campuses here in the US. Um, first, LGBTQ undergrads report the highest on-campus sexual assault and misconduct of any group. Um, so that means that if you're, if you're uh, queer or transgender and you walk onto a college campus, uh, your probability of, of being physically assaulted while on college campus is higher than any other student that's standing on that campus. Um, and in fact, 60% of LGBTQ students report incidences of sexual misconduct and harassment. Uh, so in addition to the probability that you might get assaulted being the highest, um, there's also a pretty good likelihood that you'll, you'll be harassed by other undergraduates attending your campus. And for me, I think the, the, the statistic that's really problematic is the one that's pertaining to STEM. Um, so LGBTQ students who have STEM majors are 8%, actually it's like 7.2%, I rounded way up, um, are less, are 7.2% less likely to stay in STEM majors through undergraduate degree completion. So they start out, they want, they think they want to major in STEM, but compared to their cisgender and heterosexual peers, they're 8, 7.2% less likely to stay in a STEM major versus moving into a non-STEM major, like a liberal arts degree. The really crazy thing is if they participate in a research experience, like working in a lab on campus, that number actually increases. So this is something that's usually associated with people staying in STEM and STEM retention of students. Like you, if you want students to stay in STEM, you give them a research experience, they fall in love with science and they stay in STEM. Um, but in fact, if you're LGBT and you engage in a research experience, you actually become 14% more, less likely to stay in a STEM major than your heterosexual peers. So something that's usually associated with keeping you around actually makes you more likely to leave. Um, and there's, a, there's kind of some underlying reasons that make a lot of sense for why that might be. And it's really looking at who is engaging in research and teaching on university campuses. Uh, so in, in STEM fields, 40% of LGBT people are, are not out to their, are reporting that they're not out to their colleagues. And that's, that's uh, crossing across um, both academia and, and people working in industry. So there's quite a lot of variation of, of who uh, and where they're working and what that setting is like. But it's a pretty large proportion of people that are simply not out. They're, as far as everybody at work knows, they're straight and cisgender, just like everyone else. Um, but when you look just at a university campus, 69% of faculty that are out have been made, have reported on surveys that they've been made to feel uncomfortable in their university department. So there's a really high level of motivation to stay in the closet if the, when you come out of the closet, you're being harassed or made to feel uncomfortable at work by, by your colleagues, by your peers. Um, so then it's hard to imagine how an undergraduate, an LGBT undergraduate could come into that same environment where faculty are being harassed that are LGBT and feel, feel comfortable and like it's a place for them to stay. Uh, and this really cuts across all, all disciplines. Um, in, in 2015, I think it was, there was a, a survey that was sent out to all of the members of the American Chemical Society. And uh, they, the people that responded of the people that responded, they found that 44% of chemists working in this, primarily in this country, um, had been made to feel excluded, intimidated, or harassed at work. 
Uh, so this isn't a, a physics problem or a math problem or a life sciences problem, it's a STEM problem. And I think that there's, there's some really overarching conclusions that we can draw that explain why this culture exists. Um, this is a study that was, that was done in 2017. And what they found was that despite expansive non-discrimination policies and bureaucratized accountability structures that formally protect LGBT employees that are working at the federal level in the US government. So they're working in US government agencies where there is employment protection. So even though the, the LGBT status wasn't a, a protected class of employment across the country, it was a protected class of employment in federal agencies. Um, and despite all this bureaucracy that they put in place to try to equalize everyone and protect LGBT employees along with other protected classes of employment, there was still hugely pervasive inequalities in these agencies that extended across age cohorts. So it wasn't just like affecting the older scientists that may have come out in a more difficult time um, or had their careers impeded because it was a different era. Uh, it's really across all age cohorts. It's regardless of whether you're at a lower rank or, or a higher rank where you're supervising other people. Um, and it's for both LGBT identifying women and men. So there was no, no uh, gender bias associated. Um, and so that's, that's a pretty profound statement that even when you put in place things that are intended to prevent harassment or inequality for LGBT people, um, it still persists. And that's probably because there's really heteronormative assumptions that I think often silence communication about gender and sexuality in STEM workplaces. I think that there's this really old school perception that when you come to work in a science degree, I mean, a science discipline, a science career, you leave your identity at the door, you walk in, you put on your lab coat and you're the same as everybody else. And that's really, kind of absurd in this in this era um, and it's comes it stems from the history of science where it was predominantly white men who were coming to work they had grown up at, from in a place of privilege where they were able to go to college and get a degree um, they were married as was the cultural norm to be and their wives stayed at home taking care of their children and they were able to leave all of that at their house and walk out and come into work and just think about the science um, but the reality is, is, in today's modern era, we have women, we have women with children, we have LGBTQ people, we have uh, people who are caring for elderly parents, we have people that are caring for extended families. There's all sorts of individuals that come into the room and defy those heteronormative assumptions. So I think it's time for us to start talking about gender and sexuality in STEM workplaces because it's good for everyone. It's not just good for queer people. And this is, again, extends across disciplines. There was a, uh, the American Physical Society, which is physics, uh, is actually an extremely progressive society. And, and they released a report in 2016 about the environment for LGBTQ people working in physics. And what they concluded was, that, again, that there's a heterosexist climate that reinforces gender role stereotypes in STEM work environments. Again, this is bad for women. It's bad for men. It's bad for equal gender uh, care of your family and it's certainly bad for LGBTQ people. So uh, at the Cal Academy, we're, we have a lot of researchers, we have a lot of scientists. We've been around for I think 168 years-ish. And to my knowledge, and I could be wrong, but I don't think so, I'm the first queer curator in the history of the institution. And the Cal Academy is in San Francisco, the gayest place in America, arguably, I'm sorry if you're from another place that you think is run in the running for the title of the gayest. Um, but in spite of that, I felt really isolated. I mean, certainly there were other queer people and trans people working at the academy uh, in other departments, but there was nobody else in research um, that was at the curator level. So the PI level, the principal investigator, there were some queer students, uh, but it was, it was hard. I didn't have anybody to really talk to about the kinds of things that I was experiencing as, as a researcher running my own lab. And 
so then this thing happened where uh, I guess like uh, in February, which is Women's Month, again, like I feel like I'm spewing all these facts that may or may not be true today, but I'm pretty sure this one's true. Um, we were organizing a big event for women in science uh, for Nightlife, for the Academy's Nightlife, which is our weekly uh, uh, after hours event for 21 and up. And we were inviting all these women scientists to come and talk and talk about their research and students to come and, and put together presentations and, and super fast talks. And I was so inspired by the 500 women scientists movement, which um, started just after the just after the election of he who shall not be named. And uh, it was it was started to really bring women scientists together and give them a voice. And I was so inspired by what they had done in terms of this community building. But I had this moment during organizing this event where I realized like that was actually I don't feel the sense of camaraderie as an identifying woman that I should. Um, and it's because I, I realized that I identify as queer first. Like that is the first thing, the first of all of my identities that comes to mind when I'm thinking about my community and, and um, my identity. And, and so I got to thinking like, wow, how amazing would it be if there was something like this for LGBT people in STEM? Because up until that point, I had never worked in the lab with another LGBT person. I had never studied with another LGBT person. I was the only one, sorry, after undergraduate, in undergraduate I had lots of queer friends that were in STEM, but, but upon graduating and starting graduate school, I, was, I felt alone all the way through. And all the way up until getting my, my position at the academy. And so I, I decided that I wanted to do something about it. And I came up with this idea to do an online visibility campaign. But like, let's be honest, I as a scorpion biologist did not even really know what an online visibility campaign meant. Um, so I went to first to, to a graduate student that was at the academy at the time. Uh, his name's Sean Edgerton. And he's the one that did the, the, pangle, the rainbow pangle in artwork at the beginning of this talk. He's an incredible artist. And I asked him if he thought this was a good idea and if maybe he'd like to help. And he was excited. So then the next step was that we actually needed somebody who knew what an online campaign was. Uh, so we turned to, to your very own Breakfast Club host, Laurel Allen, uh, and asked her if she thought it was a good idea. And Christina Fong, uh, who's, who's part of our social team as well, uh, she also thought it was a good idea. And so now as this small working group, we started to create this online campaign and we decided to call it 500 Queer Scientists, sort of paying homage to the 500 Women Scientists movement. Um, and we started out pretty simply. I emailed, Sean and I emailed everybody that we knew that was queer, which was to be honest, like a pretty short list. Uh, and we also emailed all of our allies and asked them if they could, if they could forward this request to any other queer scientists that they knew. And, we collected stories, short stories, 200 words, a photo, just declaring those two parts of your identity that I had felt like I had to keep separate for so long. I'm queer and I'm an arachnologist uh, and telling your own personal story. And so we took this collection of stories, which ended up being 50. We put them on a website and in a photo gallery where you can go and and look at pictures of, of LGBTQ people that look probably just like you. There's 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 a lot of us now. Uh, and we launched the campaign on, on social media, on Twitter and, and Instagram, sharing these stories and, and trying to amplify the voices of the community. And so uh, this is our first first uh, 48, is, as I like to call them. Although I, I think that's like a term from police crime detectiving to that's, I don't know, never mind. Uh, so this is the, this is the, first, the first group of, of folks that we launched the campaign with. And uh, then it expanded from there. I had no idea what was gonna happen. I had like no expectations. Um, and then it turned into to this. Uh, so within the first three weeks, so we launched in June, 2018, within the first three weeks, so by the end of June, we had 500 contributors. Uh, so we'd gone from 50 to 500 in less than a month. We'd put our name in, in, into the 500 queer scientists. And it's just continued to build from there. So in the last two years, we've had over 1,100 contributors. I think as of today, it's 1,161. Um, we've grown our social our social community to over 20,000 people uh, that we interact with on a regular basis. Our website with our gallery of, of scientists uh, and a search functionality that allows you to find 
um, people in a specific uh, field of study or a geographic area to, to connect with. Um, that website gets over 10,000 monthly, unique monthly web visitors. Um, so so that, that seems like it's working pretty, pretty well, I'd say. Uh, and just this month, we started uh, hosting mixers, speed mixers for, for people in the community to really move sort of out of the social media one degree of separation sphere and into a virtual room, a Zoom room, uh, where they get to talk to one another and meet one another and, and connect. Um, and so I think often people ask me like, well, what's happened? Like, what is, what's the result of what you've done? Um, how do people interact around this campaign? And the things that really stand out in my mind, aside from like day-to-day -day support of one another is a few. First, I thought, I wasn't sure, you know, how social goes sometimes. People get on and love to complain. And I think that's like one of the primary uses that people use social media for. Uh, but in this case, people just got on and celebrated themselves and their identity and all the aspects of their identity. And, and this tweet is, is one of my favorite um, because it, it really highlights that I wasn't alone in how I felt. Uh, it's from a, a, a person who's saying that they hadn't known of any LGBTQ faculty until they got to grad school. And they, even still, they wondered if there was a place for them here. And, and I think that that really resonates with me and really tells me that, that it, my thoughts alone in my lab and in my office uh, were being felt by all sorts of people. And probably many of those people were in places where being out is not as easy as it is in San Francisco, where I work in an accepting institution, I live in an accepting city. Uh, and so it's really like considerably easier for me than it is for many other people. Uh, here's another one that I think is really impactful. It's it's down at the bottom, there's a, a, a student who's, who's uh, tweeting at an advisor saying that they we're so excited to see their proclamation of being a, a bi scientist, and that hope hopefully they get to be a role model with that, like them one day. And and then this this advisor, this scientist, is is writing back and saying that that this is why they think Bi Visibility Day that came about just shortly after the launch of our campaign um, is so important, and that they never would have had the courage to come out if it hadn't have been for all of the people that were coming out and telling their story uh, publicly. So the last thing I wanna talk about really is, is how to be an ally because certainly the, the percentage of, of LGBTQ people like other underrepresented groups are lower than the proportion of, of heterosexual or cisgendered folks that are, that are working in STEM. And so it's really important that we have allies to help us make advances in, in our field. And I think that this is important uh, for many underrepresented groups in science. So the first thing, and uh, I'll, I'll just say that when I started this, I was I did not consider myself an activist in any way. Uh, I didn't feel like I, I, nev I had never thought that I was an activist for any reason, because I guess I had never really been much of one. Uh, and I've slowly come to the realization two years in that what I have been doing is activism. Um, and and so I don't proclaim to be an expert in, act, in activism for LGBTQ people, but, but what I have done over the years is, is listen to the community and try to pay really close attention to what they've been saying. And so this is sort of my list of, of do's and don'ts based on what I've garnered from listening for two years. So the first thing is make space for underrepresented minority voices. You have to step aside and make room for their voices. And secondly, when they are talking, you should amplify them. Don't take credit, don't take over, simply amplify what they're saying. Another thing that's, that's a really simple thing is to normalize the use of pronouns. Pronouns, I think a, a few years ago, nobody thought about pronouns. It wasn't a thing, it wasn't something that m the majority of the population had ever heard of stating. And, it's something that makes a hugely big deal if you are transgender or non-gender conforming or non-binary. It's a recognition of your identity. It's an acceptance of your identity. It's an acknowledgement of your identity. But when you're the only person in the room using pronouns or needing to state your pronouns so that other people accept and acknowledge them, it's 
very isolating. You stand out. But when everybody uses pronouns, so my pronouns are she, her, other people's might be he, his, still other people might use they, them in the singular, which is a thing. It's been around for a long time. If everybody uses pronouns, then it becomes not a big deal. So if you see somebody that identifies in a way that you may not have initially perceived, you're able to acknowledge that identity and accept that identity. And by using normalizing the use of pronouns, everybody has has it out there, it's not a big deal, nobody's standing out as isolated. Another thing that's really important, particularly concerning pronouns, is not making a big deal when you make mistakes. If The longer you dwell on it and the longer you apologize, the more of a big deal you're making. Um, so just acknowledge that you made a mistake, recognize, learn if you were corrected, and move forward. You don't need to linger on it and you, and you don't need to make a big deal about it. And I think the last thing is, is really the most important, and, and it really pertains to not only LGBTQ people, but any underrepresented group, um, and, and really just anyone who needs to bring their identity to work, which is everyone. Uh, and that's just lead through example. Your personal life and your work life are not separate. That's a binary that is something that is an artifact of a, of a different time period and one that was exclusive and not inclusive. So by demonstrating that your personal life and your work life are not separate, uh, you're letting other people around you know that it's okay for them to bring those two things together as well. Uh, so the last thing that I wanna share is, is this letter. And this is, this is for me is like, if this happened I think like in that first three weeks after we launched the campaign. And, and for me, if, if nothing else had ever come of the campaign, this would have been enough. And this is, I, I retranscribed this from a screenshot a long time ago. I don't know who either of these, of these people are, um, but, but it really, for me, one, exemplifies what a good ally is, and two, <clears throat> I think exemplifies like the importance of visibility. Uh, so, the, so I'm just gonna read this out loud because I don't know what kind of device you're on or how easy this is to see, but it's a letter. And the letter was written from a dean or a department chair at a university to a faculty member. And it says, Dear Aaron, I wanted to reach out to let you know that I saw you are publicly identifying as non-binary and to assure you that you have my support. I also wanted to check in on whether there are any changes you would like me to make in the way I or the team talks to you or refers to you. For example, name or pronouns or anything else that will help affirm your identity. Finally, please know you can come to me with any frustrations or concerns related to this or anything else. You're a great scientist and I'm proud to have you on the team. And so I think what this does is a few simple things. One, it, it acknowledges. Two, it checks in about whether they need to change what they're doing or if they've made any mistakes or if there's anything that they can do to further affirm this person's personal identity. Uh, and lastly, it opens the door for them to come and, and reach out if there is anything that's going on. Uh, so it's super supportive. And I think most importantly, at the very end, uh, it acknowledges that they're a good scientist and that that's why they're in the room. Um, they're in the room because they're great at what they do and, and not for any other reason. And all those other aspects of their identity uh, are what comes with them as a great scientist. Um, so with that, I just want to say uh, thank you so much. And if you want to follow and read stories of 1,161 LGBTQ people working in all different aspects of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, public policy, science education, et cetera, uh, you can find us at 500queerscientist.com, on Instagram at 500queerscientist, or on Twitter at 500queersci. Uh, and with that, I just want to say thank you. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. Thank you. That was awesome. Um, and for folks watching, uh, we have dropped the links for the 500 Career Scientist website and Twitter and Instagram in the comments section. Lauren, I wanted to see, do you want to um, say anything about the search functionality of the new site and how people can use that for connecting and filling panels and things like that? Yeah. So um, so we, we a few years, like I think like a, six months in, we started like a a survey where people could say like what things they really wanted us to be doing. Uh, and like the number one thing that people were like constantly emailing about and constantly saying yes to on this survey were that they wanted search functionality. Like it started out as just a gallery of 50 people. So it wasn't very hard to like go through them and find the person you were looking for. Um, but after it grew to 700 or even 500 or even 200, it was really hard to like even find yourself. 
Mm -hmm. uh, much less people that were in your field if you wanted to try to connect at a conference or in your geographic region if you wanted to try to connect for finding speakers. Um, so just in May, was it in May? I think in yeah. May. Yeah, yeah. We, we rolled out a new search functionality. We like had the website completely redone and we built in a backend database to all of the stories. And so now you can go to the search page, uh, you can search by discipline, uh, or field of study, you can search by geographic region, like if you put in a city or a state or a country, um, and you can identify speakers or just people that you wanna connect with or potential mentors or peers or find people that are in your field that you might wanna like go to a PhD with. Um, <laughs> and most of those people, we don't publish anybody's uh, like contact information, like email or anything like that, but most people have contributed their social media handles or their website, like their research website, where you can go and get their contact information. Um, and if anybody's ever not able to, I'm happy to help make that connection uh, blindly. And so I think that it's gonna be a really awesome tool. I think it'll be great for, for journalists who wanna diversify the, the people that they cover in their stories. Um, and also for diversifying speakers on panels. And um, yeah. You can learn about them before you ask them because there's a little story about them. And yeah, yeah, totally. And some we had a few people ask about the um, mixer that you mentioned also. So I think probably the easiest way is just to go to the Twitter um, yeah. and you'll see a registration link in one of our recent tweets. Yeah. Um, this is kind of a, so the, I'm going to, we have some questions for you. I was going to start with one. This is, I guess, from me. Um, a lot of that I know, but I watch you talk. I've seen you talk about this a lot, and I'm always struck by the fact, like how weird it is that you have to do this thing that is inherently so personal and so emotional in a professional sphere. Like other people don't really have to do that. No, it's and, super weird. Yeah, right. And I guess I was just wondering how, yeah, like how you think about that. Like, do you think about it as work, or do you think about it as like a, or, I, and do you resent it, or do you feel like energy is by it? And I imagine it's like all of the above, but yeah. yeah, just how you think about that. I think like one of the most exhausting things for me is like I come out all the time. Like people think about queer people coming out, like, yeah. and then you're just out. But the reality is, is you're not just out, like you have to come out every time you meet another right. person, um, especially in professional spheres where there's a heterosexual assumption like everyone just assumes that you're straight. And so therefore, as soon as they find out that you're not, there's like this awkward pause where they're like, oh, oh, I mean, you're, oh, you're not your husband. Uh, and I have, I also have like a very modern family. I have a, an adopted son who's not like a whole lot younger than me. Uh, we're like 10 years apart who I've been raising since I was 20. I have a stepson who is also like just graduated from high school. And most people look at me, I actually like, I think I look pretty, pretty actually a lot younger than I am. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a grandbaby who is my adopted son's stepson. So it gets like real complicated real fast in the moment I start talking about any of that. I have to, people have this implicit Mm, assumption that they have the right to my whole life story, which I have to lay out in order to explain my modern family. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's <laughs> sorry, I almost it's okay. Breakfast club. <laughs> it, it, it's exhausting, honestly. It really is. Yeah. It's so exhausting, and I get so sick of it. And yeah. so for me to to be able to just like proclaim like I'm queer and I'm an arachnologist felt so relieving in so many ways. Like yeah. it was like. I'm just gonna tell everyone and all at once, get it out of the way and talk about this publicly all the time. I mean, like most of my colleagues, let's be honest, like don't talk about any DEI stuff right. in a public way. It does feel like work, but it's like a kind a kind of work that I'm really passionate about. And and yeah. so it's, it's, exhaust, it's less exhausting than having to come out to people one by one on a regular basis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but it's also like you never say no to like request to come speak and stuff like that. And I yeah. think also it's just like there's such a need for people to do that work and there's just not enough people talking about it yet, right? To fill all the requests for like That's all true. the well-meaning college professors that want you to come talk to their classes and things mm -hmm. like that. Like more people, yeah. yeah, need to be doing it. I think, and I think it's growing. Like I think, I think like there's, they're really like, there really is a movement that's growing among LGBTQ people, largely fueled by social media, where it's it's safe to be open 
Yeah. Um, because you can hide behind a pseudonym or an identity online that is, doesn't endanger you in any way in your personal life. Because mm -hmm. uh, many people aren't in a place where they can be out. Uh, like maybe it's dangerous, actually physically dangerous, or maybe their family will disown them, which is a reality for many, many queer people. Um, or maybe like up until two weeks ago, they could have been fired. So there's a lot of people that aren't really in a, a safe space for being out. And so for those that are able to be visible, I think a lot of us feel like a responsibility to do so for all the yeah. ones that can't. Um, and so there's a movement and it's growing and it's fueled by social media and a lot of young people who don't feel like they need to be in the closet anymore in no small part because there's been a lot of recent wins for the LGBT community and over the last decade like mm -hmm. marriage equality and now uh, workplace equality um, unfortunately health equality is is one that's on the backslide at the moment but but hopefully that will turn around uh, next year mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> um, okay I want to dive into some questions. Uh, this one's from Nathan, and um, he asks, do you have an opinion on whether I should actively identify as gay when I give talks? For other underrepresented folks, it's clear just by looking at them, but I feel like that's not enough for us. Yeah, I think it's, you know, that's one of the things is for many LGBTQ people, uh, they like are just heterosexual cis presenting. So they mm -hmm. just like, you look at them and you're like, yeah, it's just another normal person. Like I'm a normal person, normal being like straight and like cisgendered, uh, so there's a lot of assumptions made, and and so that's why I say like one of the one of my things that I like to suggest to people is that you lead through example by merging your personal and professional lives, um, and so I in my professional talks actually now I I add like five minutes on to the end where I just talk about the the issues that are faced by by LGBTQ people in STEM and why there's a really strong like there's a real need for visibility. And so I think, I mean, I'm, I wouldn't say that I'm like super heterosexual, assumptive, cisgendered, assumptive. Like people often don't know what gender I am. I get called sir like daily. I don't know, for some reason when I wear the face mask, like with the new face masks, people always call me sir. I don't know what that's about. Like maybe because without it, they can see I don't have a beard. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I get sir pretty regularly. So so I think, I guess my point is that when I give talks, like I think people see me and they're like, oh yeah, what a what a lesbian, um, yeah. but not always. So yeah. I think it's important, especially for people that are very straight passing, to, if they're comfortable with it, to like right. tell people about that part of our, their identity and why it's been a struggle. Yeah, um, right, yeah. Putting should, it in context is important, I think. Yeah, I um, realized I should have also just started by mentioning there's like so many people thanking you for giving the talk. <laughs> you got another high five from another queer entomologist. Like Ooh. there's, yeah, there are all the, like someone is like telling you all the docents love you and that you should come hang out in the docent lounge again. Like this kind of an outpouring of um, people who are just really happy to hear you talk. So. I also love the docents. So <laughs> I'll, um, I'll take you up on that when, when we can see each other. Yes, yes. Um, okay, so let me ask one from, this one's from Kevin. What do you think the biggest change we could make is that would keep um, more underrepresented kids in the STEM pipeline? Um, I mean, I think that, I think, so there's a lot of chatter, I think right now in particular because of the Black Lives Matter movement um, about, about the STEM pipeline, which is like, how do you keep people going from like high school all or even elementary school all the way up to being having a degree in stem and working in stem mm -hmm. that's the pipeline right and and there's a lot of people that think that the solution for for diversifying stem researchers or people working in stem is to fill the pipeline when we actually know based on that research that that's not the solution like the solution is not filling the pipeline right um the solution is acknowledging people at equal levels. So like oftentimes we know that that white men are acknowledged for their accomplishments at a higher at a higher proportion than underrepresented people or women. Um, and there's been some pretty famous studies where there's people working in STEM are given like CVs of of what of people with names that are either obviously white men, obviously women, or obviously like a, a name of somebody that is likely black or a, yeah. a Hispanic person. 
and they're asked to evaluate the same CV and, yeah. and they don't evaluate it equally. So there's some implicit bias. Um, we also know that implicit bias training doesn't work. So like training people to recognize their own biases like doesn't actually reduce racism. Um, yeah. But what does work is as active allyship. So actively going out and recruiting underrepresented people, yeah. actively paying them money. Mm -hmm. um, actively acknowledging that there's systemic oppression that has led to a lower degree of support and then finding that support and providing it, uh, actively recruiting speakers that are speakers of color, that provide representation for people that are in the pipeline so that they realize they can stay in the pipeline. Um, so it, it, being an ally is really, it's, it's not like a noun, it's a verb, it's something you have to do actively, otherwise you're not doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so my recommendation is identify people, ask them how you can support them, reassure them that they're doing a good job, uh, bring people that they would then see themselves as in the future, uh, recruit yeah. good mentors. You know, yeah. I think I think it's not about the pipeline; it's about all the support that comes afterwards. And I think, lastly, like hire underrepresented people. Yeah, just, hi just hire them. Right. They're yeah. qualified. They're good. Yeah. They are amazing at what they do. They're going to bring a new perspective. And you have to recognize that there's been systemic oppression that has led to maybe their CV not looking the same in the traditional ways, but, mm -hmm. but perhaps in other non-traditional ways, it's even better. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, this one is, it relates to the ally question or the, the, what you were saying about allies, it's from Erica. And she says, would you, re would you recommend actively reaching out to queer colleagues to identify yourself as an ally or is that weird? I think, you know, it's like kind of on a person to person basis. Um, I don't think that there's anybody that would feel awkward if they received an email saying like, I just want to let you know that I support you. And if there's ever anything that you need, I am here to help. Um, but another thing that you could do is like nominate them for an award. That's a really great way to say that you're an, an ally and that you're yeah. ready to support them. Like just email them and say, hi, I'd like to nominate you for this award, like whatever internal student award, internal faculty award, like society award, whatever mm -hmm. awards there are that these people are eligible for. Um, because oftentimes underrepresented people and LGBT people get looked over for those awards. Mm -hmm. um, so just like, reaching out and asking them for their CV and telling them you want to nominate them is like a pretty great way to say like, hey, I want to be your ally and I'm here to support you. Yeah. Uh, but, but even just an email like that email that I showed at the end, just mm -hmm. acknowledging identity and asking if there's ever anything that they need to let you know. You yeah. Know, ready. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll ask you three more. Uh, okay. This one is from Kate and she says, I'm an incoming grad student. And in the past when I've tried to talk about my identity, I've had a lot of people say things like, why can't you just talk about the science or the work? Do you have a standard answer for this that I can steal? Uh, I I mean, I'm like kind of loud and like I've decided to just stop being, I, I for a long time like did not talk about my identity at work and in the lab and like that was because I was a grad student and like a nobody. Yeah. I felt like anyways. Um, I think like there's a few things. First, recognizing that as a grad student, while many people might treat you as like, not an integral part like the reality is is that people that run labs and are your advisors literally can't get their work done without people like you so you're integral to the team and without you they're going to fail at their job um so recognizing that you like have a stronger role than you might realize is i think yeah. the step one to acknowledging that you can say things back yeah um step I think the, the thing that I always say is like, oh, that's a convenient answer for somebody that is white and cisgendered and heterosexual. Mm -hmm. Like for those of us that aren't, we can't just bring the science because it's not actually an option. Yeah. Um, black people cannot just bring the science when they walk into the lab because people see the color of their skin and make assumptions. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, like super convenient answer for people that don't have to face any, any yeah. like implicit bias or judgment. Yeah, we see that a lot on social too with people who are like just let the science speak for itself or just let your work speak so for what's itself. So so what's your what's your standard answer? You probably I don't know. I have a really good one, but I need to like write it out. <laughs> <laughs> like better with the better with the written thing. Yeah. But it's just like uh, yeah, no. I mean, I think you that you said it really well. 
it's that's not it's that's just really simplistic like it's ignoring the reality of all the things that affect you in a work environment you know yeah. it's like, like i'm a person <laughs> like as and as soon as your science is not affected then you then you'll be able to talk about just your science but as long yeah. as there are factors that that change the way you do your job then like of course those need to be acknowledged yeah, yeah. totally i mean also like just but why like everybody talks about things as a water cooler like that's yeah. a standard thing like yeah. you talk about what you did on the weekend you talk about like anybody that claims that they don't talk about anything personal ever at work is right insane yeah uh, so if you can't talk about your identity then why right. then wh how do you talk about anything personal ever like right. people always chit chat i mean conferences science conferences that's like a big deal in science you go yeah. to conferences you present your research to your peers you get feedback you network for finding collaborators or future and you learn like way more about them than you ever wanted to know so People why should tell you all to? sorts of stuff yeah. of details about them so that is what networking is. like networking in science is rarely just like hi i'm lauren esposito and i work on scorpions and this is my project and i'd like to talk to you about your project that you presented on yeah. it's always like no like else. the people you remember is like because you made some personal connection often yeah but for lgbtq people who feel like they can't talk about that like how are they going to network effectively like they're yeah. not uh same for for other underrepresented groups who feel like because of the way they look they're not able to network effectively because people make implicit assumptions about them as individuals so like give me a break That's yeah just absurd <laughs> yeah it's really just code for like your your personal story makes me uncomfortable and i think like it that's is. if that's where you're coming from then there's all kinds of things that are going to make you uncomfortable these days you yeah. know and that's not going to go away so no yeah it's um, code for let's let's like continue um working in in biased environments that yeah uh, f that refuse to acknowledge their bias biases yeah, yeah totally um, yeah, so lots more comments from people who are just really, who have other helpful tips and are still are just happy to hear this being talked about. Um, okay, so let's see, let's do two, well, this one you kind of already answered um, really well, not kind of, I think. It's about the pronouns, and it was from um, Stephanie, and basically she said, I want to be supportive, but as a straight person who's very obviously female, I've never understood how I'm helping by using pronouns. What am I missing? And yeah. your point was basically that you're just making it something people can easily talk about when yeah. they're, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of people that, that push for, for just like, when you introduce yourself, like the same, like you introduce yourself in any setting. Like I, my usual thing is like, hi, I'm Dr. Lauren Esposito. I'm a curator at the California Academy of Sciences. Like then to say your pronouns, mm -hmm. if everybody did that, like it would just be pretty ordinary. Yeah. And, but when only one person does that, and it also happens to be the one person that's non-gender conforming, yeah, or transgender or non-binary, yeah. then like you're like, oh, what? Like their pronouns? Like what? That's so weird. So if it yeah. just becomes like more commonplace, it's easier. The yeah. other, like, there's another side of that coin actually, which is that while you can make it make it uh, like a more universal standard thing to use your pronouns. You also shouldn't force pronouns like on everyone um, because oftentimes those same people don't want to share yeah. their pronouns publicly. Like they would prefer to keep their pronouns to themselves and have like more private individual. Oops, Lauren looks frozen. I don't know if she is for other people watching too. Oh no, am oh, I no, frozen? you're good, you're back, okay, you're back. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think oftentimes, like, like for example, at conferences, there'll be like a place for you to put your pronouns in to your badge, and like they, you're f if you're forced to put your pronouns in, then it then it is can be uncomfortable for some yeah. folks. But if you if it's something that's optional and most people choose to do it, mm -hmm. then maybe that discomfort is alleviated a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I think if that, like, I think there's also a, like when people hear about those kinds of nuances, there's a tendency to be like, oh, it's so complicated. I'm never going to get it right. And it's mm -hmm. like, no, you're not always going to get it right, but you can get it mostly right. And then just yeah. kind of like go from there, which is all anyone really does anyway. Yeah, you can, I, I mean, I'm like the number one person to, to get it wrong. I, I can't stop this habit that I have uh, from like childhood, which is saying you guys, like it's, it's a really non-inclusive yeah. habit and I just can't stop myself and I find myself saying it and just yeah. like putting my foot in my mouth because I'm like, oh, not everybody here is guys and that's like so gendered and rude. Yeah. Uh, but I just like, just you're going to make mistakes. Everybody yeah. makes mistakes. Just yeah. move on. Yeah. Move on. Good advice. Um, let's see. Okay, just two more. 
One, this one's from Megan and she, um, I think I'd like tricked you before and said two more before, but really two more. She says, can you explain a little bit more about how he the heteronormative, heteronormative culture is bad for everyone? I'm not doubting it, it's just a new idea for me. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, what, yeah, so what heteronormative culture effectively means is that men work and women stay at home and take care of the kids. Um, I, I don't know about most people in modern relationships, because as a queer person, I've never been in a heterosexual relationship, but I like to think that most people are moving towards a model where both partners equally share household duties and childcare. Mm -hmm. um, so when there's a heteronormative assumption about the workplace, what that means is if you're a man, you go to work and you leave you leave your children and wife at home and you don't have to deal with them all day, you can just focus on work. Um, but I'd like to think that men in modern relationships with children go to work and sometimes have to go pick their kids up from school when they're sick or have to get home by 3.30 because their kid's getting out of school and they're the one in charge of childcare for the evening or they're yeah. making dinner or they're t going to soccer practice or you know whatever the case may be. So when it's a heteronormative assumption about the workplace, like it affects women negatively, it affects men who are trying to be equal partners negatively because their peers look at them like a crazy person for taking care of the children. Uh, and it affects LGBTQ people negatively. But in addition to all those, it also creates like problems for, for example, people that are taking care of elderly parents, which I think oftentimes people do. They're responsible mm -hmm. for the care of their elderly parents. Uh, and in the heteronormative culture of work, there's no talking about your elderly parent that you're caring for or leaving work in the middle of the day to care for them or you know, whatever the case may be, it just affects every aspect of anybody who doesn't leave their wife and kids at home and go to work. Yeah. And I think even when it doesn't manifest like that, because that may be, there may be people out there who are like, that's super 1950s. That's not how stuff manifests anyways. But I think even when it doesn't manifest like that precisely or in really like concrete, it's still a question of like whose voices are heard and whose voices are valued and where are the power mm -hmm. dynamics and things like that. So it's like totally. any of those traditional systems um, aren't going to be good for people who weren't traditionally heard to the same degree. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I think like if anything about, about this COVID crisis has shown us is that like for a lot of, a lot of couples that are working at home right now, mm -hmm. like a lot of the primary childcare is falling to the women. Like mm -hmm. there's been a lot yeah, of chatter about totally. that, how the primary yeah. childcare has been falling to the women, even though both are working at home full time and full time caring for their children. Um, and so like that's just in a classic example of like why heteronormative yeah. culture is a problem because it shouldn't just be falling to the women and like and if it is it shouldn't be a problem because we're in a weird time and that should just be like there should be mechanisms to accommodate for that yeah totally um this is like society 101 class right now yeah um this one Fixing is all the problems what yeah totally and introducing new ones um this one's from Adam, and I guess we'll end with this one because it's a nice place to just, it's a its a nice tidy question. Um, he runs a lab at a community college and he's just asking what can I do to ensure that it's welcoming and comfortable and that I'm creating a culture where all students know what's expected of them. Um, I think it was a tidy question, but I don't actually know what I, I'm not like, I don't know that I'm the best person to answer it. I, we can I mean, brainstorm think, some stuff. Yeah, I think like, Things that I that I think super careful about, um, like examples of research that you present to your lab group or to your students, um, mm -hmm. and making sure that those are like diverse from diverse sources. Mm -hmm. uh, so oftentimes, I think we present like the most classic examples, and oftentimes because they're like the older and more well developed systems. Yeah, they're from white men, uh, mm -hmm. and trying to introduce newer newer examples that are from a diversity of sources or older examples that are from a diversity of sources that maybe weren't as well publicized because they were from underrepresented people uh, is a great is one great step um, encouraging encouraging students to like then look up those researchers like look up their lab and see like what they're up to mm -hmm. then they get to like see the people or like showing videos of them speaking they get to like see their personalities and how and the diversity of personalities and people that are out there doing research yeah uh is one is definitely a couple things um you know a lot of people put these like stickers up on their office doors that are yeah. like all are welcome here I, I, 
guess those are fine. I mean, I don't, I think they're kind of like virtue signaling mm -hmm. and I don't know how welcome that makes anybody really feel. Um, yeah, maybe, but maybe it also signals that like that person knows they're supposed to be someone you can talk to if you need to. Yeah. You know, I think so too. And also like when it becomes universal, like if, if everybody in the whole department has those, then it's, yeah. I think it's an indication that like mm, biases aren't tolerated. Yeah. Or, like bigotry is not tolerated. Yeah. Um, so it's like a that's, subtle behavior cue for ev yeah. for other people too who aren't yeah. like yeah uh, and but I think like introducing yourself as a human to your students is good a good step to make them know yeah. that like where you're coming from and where you're at yeah uh, and I just had something else in my brain but now I forgot it yeah. I mean, that sounded pretty good. There's probably some good like online resources too if you just Google it. Like there's a lot of people who actually have taken time to like build out resource kits and stuff. Yeah. I'm surprised if there wasn't good fit out mm -hmm. there. Yeah. And I think uh, like like one thing, one thing that I think you do actually is like taking time to have like one-on-one -on -one meetings regularly that aren't like necessarily just like strictly work focused that are mm -hmm. also like time to just talk uh, as humans. Yeah. Uh, with students, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, with students yeah. or with anybody that you work with or that mm -hmm. works for you or you work with is like just a way to rec to acknowledge that there's more to us than just our jobs, and like sometimes we just need yeah. to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Um, thank you. Also, Jenna would like to know if it's possible to get a copy of your slides. I don't know if you want to. We can share those back if you want, but I don't know. Yeah, I think we'll I could probably we'll put reply. them somewhere. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, that was so good. There's so many, like, you should go back and read all the comments because there's so many nice ones from people. Um, I want to say this oh, is, go ahead. No. Just about the slides. I just yeah. wanted to say that on the 500 Career Sciences resources page, oh, yeah. that's like a page on our website. Um, that's where like all these figures come from for the most part. So mm -hmm. so if you are looking for, for valid sources of information, we've got a whole lot of great sources. Yeah, good point. Um, again, that link is in the comment section or the chat box on both platforms. Um, and yeah, I want to end by saying this is part one of a two-part series. So come right back here on Thursday, this Thursday. We're going to have a panel of 500 QS members. So Lauren will be back. We're also going to have Dr. Jessica Ware from the American Museum of Natural History, Roberto Diaz from UCSF, Krisha Aggie from UC Berkeley, Rob Ulrich from UCLA. Um, yeah, and you. And I'll be here to offer useless commentary as well and move windows around on screen. But um, yeah, thank you so much for being here. I can't wait to see you again Thursday. Um, and if there are questions we didn't get to, we'll try to circle back. But yeah, thanks so much for coming to Breakfast Club. We'll see you in a few days.